Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Johnson, and um, I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Engineering and Physical Sciences at Queen's University. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome you all to this event on behalf of the Royal Irish Academy and the Chief Executives Club and the School of Maths and Physics at Queen's. Um, I'd also like to expand, extend a very warm welcome to our guest speaker, uh, Professor Susanna Huelga, joining us today from Ulm University in Germany. Um, I'd also like to briefly outline um, the, the schedule for today's event. Professor Huelga will give an address in a moment of around 40 minutes. And then after that, my colleague, uh, Professor Mauro Paternostra, the head of the School of Maths and Physics, will lead a question and answer session um, with, with our speaker. Um, you're very welcome to submit questions anytime using the Q&A facility uh, on the screen. And if you give your name and your organisation, that will enable us to, to track the questions. I'd also like to ask if everybody could keep their microphones muted throughout the event, and that will help us with the, the sound quality for the, for the presentation for everyone online. We expect the Q&A to conclude at roughly 1.30. And then Professor Jerry McKenna, the Senior Vice President of the Royal Irish Academy, uh, will make some closing remarks. This lecture series is named in honour of one of our Queen's University graduates, uh, John Stuart Bell. And the aim is to raise awareness of the contribution of this remarkable scientist whose discovery on the 4th of November 1964 changed the world of science by laying down the foundations for quantum computing and quantum theory. The Royal Irish Academy, founded in 1785, is the Academy for the Sciences and Humanities for the whole of Ireland. And today, the Academy continues to play a pivotal role in Irish society, bringing together academia, government and industry uh, to address issues of mutual interest. It makes a significant contribution to the public debate and to public policy issues in science, and technology and culture. Similarly, the Chief Executives Club at Queen's plays an important role in forging and strengthening connections between the university and the business community. It's also important that I tell you a little bit more about uh, John Stuart Bell. Um, I'm pleased to say that John Bell's niece, Dorothy Whiteside, who attended previous lectures with us, has also joined online today. Um, John Bell is known globally for his work leading to Bell's theorem. Um, that remains a benchmark in quantum me uh, mechanics and experimental physics. Um, Bell's theorem resolved a decades-old dispute involving Albert Einstein and showed that some of Einstein's views on quantum mechanics were incorrect. Bell's work also laid the foundation of technology that stands placed to revolutionize many aspects of computing. Um, and, and as a software engineer, I'm incredibly grateful and partially threatened by the changes that lie ahead. Um, John S. Bell was nominated for a Nobel Prize and was described by the Institute of Finite Physics as one of the top 10 physicists of the 20th century. Bell's theorem was first published some 56 years ago, and that's why our lecture series um, chooses to celebrate today as, as John Bell Day. He was born in 1928 in Belfast into a typical working class family and attended Belfast Tech before starting work as a lab assistant in the physics department at Queen's. Um, the professors, uh, Carl Emelaeus and, and Robert Sloan, recognised his ability and encouraged him to attend lectures. Um, he then enrolled for a degree and achieved two first class honours degrees at Queen's, completing a PhD in England before going to work at CERN in Switzerland. Um, and his work and contribution obviously profoundly changed many aspects of, of both physics and the wider um, scientific community around us. And now to our, our guest speaker. Susanna Huelga is a quantum physicist. Her work focuses on the dynamics of open quantum systems with an emphasis in understanding under which precise conditions quantum features persist in systems subject to environmental noise and identifying which mechanisms underpin persistent, coherent behaviour. This research line started during her PhD at Oviedo University, where she investigated opt optical tests of fundamental quantum behaviour. That led to a first contact with some of the ideas from John Bell. 
Following postdoctoral appointments at Oxford and Imperial, she became a, re a reader at the University of Hertfordshire and moved to Germany in 2009 to take up a professorship at Ulm. She is currently part of the Centre of Quantum Bioscience, which is a collaborative institute that brings together internationally leading research teams from the fields of theoretical physics, experimental quantum optics, organic chemistry, and molecular, molecular virology. Um, I'd just like to say uh, a great welcome and a thank you to Ms. Welga. We will now give the uh, 2022 John Bell uh, a lecture on coherent effects in biological processes. Professor Welga. Many thanks. I'm going to share my screen. If I see the bottom, which I don't, what has happened? Sorry about that. I cannot see the share screen. The bottom has disappeared from my. How can that be? Uh, Something has happened. Might it be on your other screen, Susanna? Right. No, I think this is the first time ever that I cannot see the share screen. We just did, a, just for the audience, we just did a try and was perfect. Sorry about that. Should I maybe log out and in again? Yeah, because that's somehow a good idea. I think this seems to be blocked at the moment. If you press the escape key, that may reset. Yeah. If you I leave. Apologies for the inconvenience. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that the problem will be solved. Will be solved immediately. It must be in the transition from the from the practice session to the to the to the um, actual webinar. So uh, hopefully, will be fixed shortly. Susanna, you are muted. You can hear me now. Yes. Right. But I remain unable to share the screen. Su Susanna, if you uh, if you want to send me your your slide, I can I, I think I can show them from my from my side. I see a share screen from my end. So if you uh, if you want to send me the slide, I will I will take care of it. But how oh, is this possible? <clears throat> Do you see it in the other screen that you have? No, no. And everything is here, right? Apart from sharing this. Wait a second. Wait a second. Yes, uh, Susanna, we can oh, see. Okay. Can see Beautiful. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. That rather eventful starting. So good afternoon for actually the Albert Einstein Allee, which is a, a happy coincidence. You may know that uh, Albert Einstein, which I would argue was the, the main motivator for Bell's work, was actually born in Ulm. And um, I will be presenting a talk to this somehow. There seems to be a conspiracy. Yeah. Uh, aim at with, with the core theme of benchmarking quantum behavior, right? That we can argue that was an, an aspect, a key aspect nowadays that started, I would say, quantitatively with the with the work of John Bell. 
This is something that we are now used to do routinely in, in the context of um, quantum technologies, for instance, where, let's say, starting with the type of inequalities that then developed to many more follow-ups, right? Now we have ways to really quantitatively argue that in the setup we are using, indeed, there are phenomena whose statistics or the observation that we see, right, is or has to be governed by quantum mechanics. However, there may be other scenarios where this is not that obvious, right? And this is what we're going to focus today and try to relate with the spirit of, of John Bell's work. Hmm? So in particular, more modest than that, I'm going to be dealing with the behavior happening on ultra-fast time scales, and that takes place in a range of membrane protein or membrane attached systems, right? Where upon irradiation, a type of evolution will happen that underpins a process that is relevant for biology. So this may refer to photosynthesis, can be radical pair formation, which is thought to be able to explain the bird navigation. As you see, as you will see in a moment, retinal isomerization, the ultra fast um, process that initiates vision, allosteric regulation, perhaps chiral induced spin selectivity. Those are our examples of processes where we will have a very high quantum yield happening in a femtosecond time scale. And we will argue that in order to understand what are the microscopics underpinning this quantum yield, we do need to resort to a quantum mechanical description. Hmm? So simply because it's the field where we have more experimental information, and I will focus on the initial steps of photosynthesis, and in particular in energy transfer, which may not be the more um, relevant biologically, right? But um, as I will explain later, this is a phenomenon that in certain organisms, we may be able to provide numerically exact techniques. Hmm? So the idea is that upon irradiation, your sunlight, right? During evolution, nature has been able to engineer a very nicely time arrangement in such a way that in specialist um, chloroplast in plants, for instance, some specialized organelles, what we have are assemblies of highly absorbing molecules that are hosted in a protein scaffold and whose role is convey excitations from the chlorosome antenna to a reaction center where a stable charge separation will happen and all the biochemical reactions leading to ATP will take place. So following absorption, this is a process that happens essentially with 100% efficiency. So I will describe very, very fundaments of these pigment protein complexes and give the gist of the type of experiments that have been performed and lead eh, to the idea that we may need a quantum mechanical description explain what is meant with the term long leaf coherence that appears frequently in this literature. And then we will make a sum up of the type of models we've developed to try to understand this spectroscopy bulk of data, right? Making it consistent with some microscopic description. Hmm? 
Then we will move to make a connection with the work of Bell by means of identifying how useful would be having agnostic tests, right? That very much like Bell inequalities would allow us to discriminate blocks of theories that are not able to account for the experimental data. Eh? And then we will use some tools developed in the framework of quantum information theory to do that job. And we'll see what sort of conclusions we can draw. Hmm? So this is again a schematics just for, to, for you to, to get a, a frame to see what type of processes we are talking about. Hmm? So this is a model system particularly useful despite it's just a, a bit of a rare organism living in, in highly light deprived areas and therefore being able to really trap every photon that is around. This is the so-called Fenner-Matthew Olson complex, which was in fact the first pigment protein complex that was um, crystallized and analyzed by X-ray crystallography. Should you have interest, you can even check what is the structure in the protein data bank and then realize that we are dealing with an assembly that involves eight bacterial chlorophylls, right? That are embedded in a cast whose role is placing them in the right positions and with the right configuration. And that you may start thinking rather than of having a, a rigid structure, right? Having in fact a sort of breathing surroundings that will be providing us with a, with a reservoir, a reservoir of forms in this case. So as a physicist, what would you do initially to try to think about putting forward a model to see how this arrangement should be able to carry on excitation energy from one place to another. Well, you would write a Hamiltonian, right? And identify what sort of coupling do we have in between the light absorbing chromophores in such a way that say energy absorbed by one of them, this blue here, will be able to be conveyed across. Well, to start with, you need information about what would be the optical transition frequency of each chromophore, and then information about how would they talk to each other, right? Well, the talking would be Upon promoting excitation, we will have a dipolar coupling in the chromophore, so we can see, okay, indeed, energy can migrate. And then we will have different, depending on the specific protein environment, we will have the side energies um, of each different chromophores. And one thing we can realize in the moment that we have a coherent coupling between chromophores is that Possibly, right, depending on the strength of this coupling and depending on how noisy the surroundings are, right, some delocalized excitations may form, right? So, as we will see later, the role of the protein scaffold, this path of phonons, is going to be responsible on the one hand of making different side energies across the network, right? And the fast and slow motions of the protein would the ones be responsible for having dynamical disorder, defacing, and also static one. Okay, you have that theory, but you need to put some numbers in if you want to start making simulations and trying to see whether the Hamiltonian you put forward has actually anything to do with the type of data that experimentalists have measured. Hmm? So, as a result of the complexity of the electron phonon interaction, it's very difficult to carry on from first principles. 
So normally what people have done in order to have um, values for the side energies and for the coupling in between chromophores is make fittings to experimental data. And you will see that this is a very important issue in this discussion. Yeah. So let's say the type of numbers that I will be using listed here are such that they are able to account for linear absorption, linear decroism, circular decroism, whatever data we have at hand. Okay, so that would be my starting point. I have a model that had some adjustable parameters that have been obtained fitting with all the artillery of experimental data. Okay, so what triggered, because people have been doing this, investigating this type of um, complexes, specifically in photosynthesis for many, many years, so I would argue that the type of experiments that trigger the attention outside this uh, community were experiments performed um, more than 10 years ago in Berkeley, initially in the group of Graham Fleming, and then by Greg Engel is the first author, and then in his own group later on, where we move from the linear response to analyze multidimensional spectroscopy. Hmm? So what does this mean? This means that now I move to experiments where I have the possibility to illuminate my system in separate time intervals in such a way that possibly coherence can build up in one part of the experiment will then evolve and will be dropped subsequently. Hmm? So a full description of this type of, say, generalized four-wave mixing is quite complex, but you can get the main idea if you think about a much simpler configuration that is just a Ramsey setup. Hmm? So imagine, the very simplest case where we will have a dimeric structure, eh, making only by two chromophores, right, whose cohering interaction leads to the formation of two excitons, E1 and E2, hmm, with some excitonic gap, capital omega. If I would, by means of this first pulse, create a coherent superposition, of these two excitonic states, if I let them evolve, then some coherence phase relation between the two elements of the superposition will build up. And if I apply a second pulse and check for the excitonic populations, I will typically have a sinusoidal signal that is a witness of this coherent evolution. If you perform the very same experiment in, in real experimental conditions, this exponential signal will be dumped out, right? So that this coherent oscillation will have a certain lifetime. Okay, so the reason for the excitement following two-dimensional spectroscopy experiments is because there is a difference in the time scale of what would be the lifetime of a superposition between ground and excited state versus the lifetime of a superposition of excitonic states. Okay? So the terminology long leaf coherence refer to the lifetime of these superpositions, which points towards having a non-trivial dynamics in the excited state manifold. So is that fact? The fact that there could be oscillatory behavior involving excitonic superpositions on an extended time scale, let's say comparable to the typical picosecond time scale for energy transfer, the one that make people to become interested in this type of pigment protein complexes. 
So there you can have, let's say, an open system viewpoint saying, okay, I want to understand why is that possible? What sort of mechanisms are at play that in this very noisy environment, yeah, subject to the influence of these uh, protein scaffold that is moving all the time, how is it possible that I do have coherent remnants in my signal? That would be one thing. And then you can think forward and say, well, actually, if indeed there is coherent behavior in that time scale, is it possible that can actually may have some relevance for function? So can it be that in fact, certain tasks are performed more efficiently as a result of this coherence. So take into account that here the idea would be very much like you do need a shared entanglement so that to perform quantum state teleportation with unit fidelity, right? The task here would be analyzing which sort of biological task we can indeed and controversially benchmark as happening with certain efficiency as a result of coherent behavior. We've made a lot of progress, I think, in the first issue, but I would say that the long uh, range one, right, is still in the agenda to be completed. Right. Now, depending for, from of your background, how would you start this story of really try to see if you can build up a microscopic model that is consistent with this um, type of observation and able to exhibit excitonic coherence? Well, the first thing you can do is really almost a back of the envelope calculation where you supplement the Hamiltonian we wrote in the first slides with some decoherence process. Eh? In fact, defacing will happen, phase randomization will happen in a much faster time scale. Well, if we do that, we encounter, I think, the first uh, useful lesson. And is that the type of complexes we are dealing with are such that they operate or they seem to operate optimally at some intermediate noise levels, in the sense that if I evaluate what is the probability eh, that a certain excitation will be conveyed efficiently to the reaction center, and I plot it as a function of the decoherence rate, I encounter this non-monotonic behavior, where you see that having little or a lot of noise is not advantageous for transfer. Yeah. So it looks like in these scenarios, systems like to be sitting in the fence or not being totally coherent where some delocalized excitons may never be conveyed to the reaction center, not that noisy that essentially um, you will have a, a strong inhibition of any coherence through phasing. Indeed, there has been a very nice experiment recently in the ion, in the trap ion group of Rainer Blatt and Christian Ross, showing how definitely this mechanism can be nicely observed should you have the, the right many body configuration. But it would be a little bit adventurous, right, to claim that this little model that we have done has anything to do with actual pigment protein complexes. And to convince ourselves of that, we only have to look at what is the sort of spectrum of the fluctuations that have been either measured or, let's say, computed, half measured, half supplemented with molecular dynamics. Because what we realize is that we are in a situation where all the typical assumptions I will need to microscopically derive the type of master equations I used do not hold. You can say, well, we have um, several techniques that may allow us to be a little bit more sophisticated 
and actually bringing some of the vibrational modes that are more strongly coupled and formulate a reduced description now with the remaining modes. But this becomes questionable very quickly, especially in, in, in the presence of a highly, highly structured spectral density. And as we will see very soon, performing embeddings and thinking it will be highly innocuous is actually not the case. So taking into account that we are in a situation, if we look at the range of electronic and vibrational couplings, where it's very complicated, let's say, or very, let's say, you wouldn't like to be ransom of approximations that you are not fully convinced about. We will try to see whether we can actually not use reduced equations of motion, but try to proceed um, in a numerically exact manner. And this is the first instance of using techniques that have been developed in quantum information. Yeah? So we will use tensor network methods to be able to draw some conclusions starting of initial. So we really have a Hamiltonian and I don't want to perform any tracing out of the environmental degrees of freedom. Right, again, if we consider a model system that is provided by the lowest energy excitons of FMO, the ones that are responsible for the strongest signals in the spectroscopy, we can do that exactly. And already realize of some mechanism that may play in favor of having long leaf excitonic coherence. Because if we rewrite the total Hamiltonian that now also includes the vibrational modes, if we write it in the basis that makes the electronic interaction diagonal, so if I write it in the excitonic basis, then we can see that the role of the vibrational modes is actually inducing transitions that for sharp modes will be quasi coherent. So in a cartoon like this means that if the spectral density I'm dealing with exhibits resonances in the proximity of excitonic gaps, then if I think of what is the effect of this coupling in the presence of other modes, well, this is having like a built-in way of regenerating the coherence that may be lost as a result of the far off resonant part of the spectral density and having then the ability very much like a quantum optical system that is simultaneously driven in and defacing, having the possibility of regenerating coherence and observing excitonic superpositions beating in a sufficiently long time scale. So as I mentioned before, the technique that we use is based on the TDMRG. Okay? So it uses the fact that we can unitarily map a configuration where our dimeric electronically coupled system is subject to the phononic path due to this protein scaffold, a mapping in a configuration that is suitable to perform efficiently um, the energy. And these are the results that indeed we obtain without the need of resorting to a master equation description. And is that in the presence of a reservoir that exhibits sufficient structure, I do have the possibility of keeping alive oscillations that will otherwise dissipate. I can maintain it if you look at the blue curve beating on a picosecond time scale. Importantly enough, 
should I repeat the calculation now, even at room temperature? This would be indication saying that maybe indeed the lifetime of this excitonic coherence could be reaching a time scale where things interesting happen. Now, think in the mind of an experimentalist, what I'm plotting in here and the analysis I've done is the real part of the coherences of the off diagonal element of the object that characterizes the electronic degrees of freedom. Okay? So the simulation that I've done covers the whole universe. I trace out the modes, and now I look at the reduced density matrix for the electronic part. This is not accessible. This is the problem. In this type of systems, we cannot aim at performing a full tomography of uh, the dynamics. Mm -hmm. And then as a result, the big difficulty is to make a theory that is consistent with all the experimental observation, including the multidimensional response. So I'm gonna show you what the problems are and how we have to proceed in to make a reconciliation between microscopics and experiments. But before I enter in that more technical part, let me yes, very schematically make a brief link with the second issue I mentioned before. So we see that we may be in the path of understanding microscopically what keeps coherence alive. Now, the second twist, is this coherence useful? Well, uh, a suitable framework to answer that question is a thermodynamic viewpoint. Eh? Because we can think of actually our pigment protein complex as operating in between two heat reservoirs. And then we can identify some figure of merit of how efficient this excitation energy transfer is. So for instance, what is the power that is delivered? Hmm? Well, this is a situation where formulated in those terms, I can identify that indeed the power delivered is assisted by coherence. Okay. I don't claim that this is in any way a proof that um, coherent behavior would definitely be advantageous in nature. It's simply just an indication of what type of arguments we will need to make more and more sophisticated and closer to natural operation in order to be able to conclude a quantitative link between coherence and optimized performance. That way we will have, let's say, a, a model that covers all the aspects we wanted, right? In the sense that we have some microscopics that should be coherent with the response, linear and nonlinear, right? have also an enhanced performance according to some figure of merit, right? In the case I mentioned, just in terms of this enhanced power delivered. So the numerically exact analysis I showed you before, I think uh, was for us one reason to be optimistic that this picture somehow is coming together, but you may also think what other people are thinking about. And I think this is probably state of the art of um, article published in Science Advance in 2020, where and this includes both theorists and experimentalists, they remain skeptical, not about the presence of coherence behavior in the spectral response, but actually, in the actual relevance it may have in natural conditions, right? In the sense that they argue, right? 
that um, indeed, uh, despite noise effects are exploited, right? The lifetimes that one would assign to purely electronic coherence remains uncertain. Hmm? So in their case, in particular, they argue more in favor of having all the long leaf oscillations due to contributions, not in the excited state, but actually ground state coupled to vibrations, right? Okay, so let's see how we can, can uh, counteract those arguments. And in fact, a claim that the debate is still there. You may have complained already saying, well, you make a big fuss of the analysis being numerically exact, but actually you trimmed a lot the spectral function in such a way that you left a conveniently resonant vibrational mode, right? So here we have now two dimeric structures. This one, the WSCP, the water-soluble chlorophyll protein is actually a dimer naturally, while the special pair in reaction center has some additional chromophores. But you see that here I've put the complete spectral density with all the peaks that have been identified. Well, now we can treat with those. I mean, this uh, I just listed here, a collection of works that have been making more and more elaborate the tensor network methods in such a way that now, thanks to some clever mapping to be able to map all the temperature dependence in the spectral density, and therefore being able to make simulations always at t effectively at t equals zero, we are able to have numerically exact results for the complete spectral density. Right, so then here, there's a lot of information, but I only want you to focus on two of the graphs. So in the right upper corner, we have the complete spectral density, and you see that I've marked um, the first 20, 40, and 55 modes. And here in the middle, right, this is a calculation of the exact absorption spectra, right, which is going to be compared with the green cycles that are experimental data. And I've performed the calculation with an spectral density that has been treated completely when I include all the 55 modes that is in black. You see that it coincides completely with the measured one. And you can see what is the obtained absorption spectra when I actually make some coarse graining of the true spectral density. So you see that there are differences, right? That's what I mentioned at the beginning, that is quite dangerous to think that, ah, this high energy tail probably as is so far of resonance from any excitonic excita excitations are just embedded uh, in, a, in a big Lorentzian blob, or I even uh, introduce a, a, a previous cutoff. We do need to include the full structure so that to be able to account for the green dots that were determined experimentally. Now, recall that these type of fittings are at the root of all the theory program, because these fittings are the ones that are used to compute, right? What are the inputs to the Hamiltonian part? This we can skip. The point is that if I do a recalculation of what are the values I need to include in my Hamiltonian okay, in such a way that I'm consistent with the absorption spectra evaluated with the full spectral density, the values of energies and coupling change. 
And therefore, when I use this new Hamiltonian to evaluate the two-dimensional spectral response, then what I encounter is that, depending on the complex, right, in fact, the electronic contribution to the 2D signal may actually be enhanced, right? So this would be, let's say, state of the art. This was just work publishing a few months ago. If we include the full spectral density, we are in the presence now of really not only a vibronic dynamics that hybridize electronic and photonic, phononic degrees of freedom, but actually this mixing is in fact multi-mode and affect the assignations you do of the origin okay, of the lonely signals in the spectroscopy. Okay, so this is one of the take home uh, measures that I would like to have made clear, right? And that's the fact that given that we cannot probe these systems in such a way that they can be tomographically resolved, right? Connecting the dynamics and the spectral response is not trivial at all. And is this fact the one that has prevented an unambiguous interpretation of the experimental data. Okay? Not as coherence is present, it is, right, for sure, right? But what is the nature? Is it purely electronic? Is it purely uh, vibrational? No, it's very likely to be vibronic, right? And now you see that assigning the specific contribution that comes from excitonic superpositions really is a risky business to do unless you do have the possibility to fully simulating the spectral density in all its complexity. Right, so I think I'm not doing too well with the time, but given that we lost a few minutes with my crazy start, let me try to make now a connection with, or, or the way I, uh, I somehow see the connection with the ideas that Bell put forward. You see that if I want to proceed microscopically, I have many unknowns, right? You've seen how even for dealing with a truly dimeric system, I have to deploy the start of the art numerical techniques. So it would be nice in parallel to have the possibility to reason using agnostic tests, very much in the spirit of bell type inequalities. So I would like to have a formalism that allows me to characterize the capability of theories, right? In such a way that then I can link this capability to some observable quantity, right? And then being able to discriminate blocks of theories that definitely do not agree with what I'm measuring. Eh? So I may not identify the right one. I may not gain a lot of information concerning how to start an ab initio derivation, but at least there are blocks of theories that I can then forget about them. Hmm? In uh, all these, remember that also excluding premises is always a tricky business. In fact, the word loopholes was one of the first one I learned during my PhD. So what would be the counterpart, if you want, of this type of Bell test in the scenario we're dealing with? Well, it can be the use of another technique that has been developed in information theory, which is the use of resource theories. Hmm? So resource theories share, in my view, the, the spirit of, of Bell formalism in the following way. This is a theoretical framework where you decide on a type of operations and states that you can use for free, right? And um, anything that is outside that free set 
can then become a resource to perform certain tasks that with the free elements is impossible or making it even if it was possible much more efficient. So the canonical example would be the resource theory of entanglement, right? Free is calling by phone, right? And performing local operations and then entanglement can become a resource to do tasks that were precluded by LOCC. Recently, people have also developed a resource theory of thermodynamics, where now the operations and states that are free are jeep states. So essentially, you can deploy um, Markovian reservoirs at will, right, and perform any unitary that commutes with the total system plus bath Hamiltonian. The point is that very much in the same way that in the, in the theory of entanglement, you can decide whether or not a given transformation between states is possible by a majorization in the context of resource theories of thermodynamics, you can do the same by means of using thermomajorization. Yeah. This is essentially a rule that would allow you to thermal ordering the weights of different states and then decide whether or not it's possible to move from one to another with a thermal operation. Yeah. Okay, how does this have anything to do with um, pigment protein complexes. Well, Nicole Junger and David Lima were the first one to suggest the possible use of resource theory to analyze some processes in biology. And the example they use, and is the one I will use as well, is uh, retinal. Retinal is a single chromophore that is hosted in another skeleton, rhodopsin, right? And the important thing is that the very primary step underpinning vision is in fact the isomerization of retinal going from a cis to a trans, so in between two stable configurations, right? This is again another um, ultra fast processing happening with a, with a very high yield. And in fact, the, the way the protein environment is steering this um, photoisomerization is not yet fully understood. Okay? Experiments point towards the presence of a true conical intersection, but it would be nice to actually have a way to characterize without making any microscopics, putting any black box of what may be going on in between starting with trans and a few femtoseconds later ending in a different configuration, just on abstract grounds in such a way that the yield, so what is the probability that you end up in the right state, okay, can be bounded. So then the main idea is use thermomajorization okay, to characterize how large can be the yield, how efficient I can be if I'm only allowed to use thermal operations to photoisomerize retinal. In fact, this fact can be computed analytically. Eh? So this will generalize the results of Nicole and, and Richard. And if you are interested, you can have a look at a recent paper by us where we characterized exactly what is the optimal thermal yield that you can achieve in this process. Completely agnostically, you only impose that the process is thermal. How is actually happening is out of the theory. And the important thing that comes across is that one can show that if you supplement the requirement of thermality by Markovianity at any point in the evolution, right? Then you cannot separate the maximum bound. So how this is useful? Well, this is useful in the sense that you identify an observable 
the isomerization yield. And then you have a way to see that if you become close to the maximum or you saturate it actually, then, then you can disregard any underpinning dynamics that is Markovian. So this is, I think, a promising route that has started just uh, recently. And that would be interesting to keep in parallel with the ab initio approach in order to be able to characterize definitely microscopic descriptions that cannot do the job, yeah, as blocks. We still may not know the right one, but we can say, okay, for instance, a Markovian description of isomerization in retinal is not tenable. What is next? Well, next, uh, we expect a next generation of experiments that actually should be able to implement, control, um, target, let's say, specific regions and specific features that we can link to having coherence in the excited state. And as I mentioned, trying to push the resource theory approach. Okay. So I think I will conclude in here, let's say that our aim will be indeed consolidating this picture that is emerging in these time scales of having a control arrangement between coherence and noise so that to optimize the performance of our system of interest. And I hope I didn't overshot too much by concluding here. Thank you very much, Susanna. Thank you for, for this fantastic talk. Uh, th 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 thanks indeed. Um, uh, do not worry about, about, uh, uh, about time. We are still on time. And indeed, we have, uh, we have time to address uh, a couple of questions that have been posed uh, while, while you were speaking. So um, one of them was, um, was asked by, by my colleague, Chavda Todorov, um, working in the school and asking um, is, a, is a structured question, so I hope I will be able to convey to convey the gist of it in a in a in a successful successful manner. So Chavda wonders um, in open system dynamics there are basically two scenarios: where one where you have a system coupled to another one that you have already traced out and 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 you treat effectively, so to say, phenomenologically or nearly. The other scenario is where you have a, a basically an initial approach, so something like a many body system mm -hmm. uh, connected you know, all those parties are connected among each other and um and that uh, exchange energy and and um, um citations among them so is the second scenario the scenario the multi the, the many body one mm -hmm. fitting to the um uh, class of problems that you are dealing with than the first one yes let's say that um to describe this type of systems is a little bit like I'm, like I'm peeling an onion, right? There are different layers of complexity. So if you want to account, for instance, for um, roughly some linear spectroscopy, right? You may do quite well with certain reduced descriptions, okay? And um, let's say even, the absorption spectrum that I showed you, when you see the effect of being including sequentially more and more modes, I'm sure that you could um, end up cooking up, right? A uh, master equation, so bringing some suitable modes and being able to, to do it. However, take into account that you want that model then to be able to explain not only that absorption spectra, but also when I come to you with now two T data. And there is the problem. There you may or may not be able to do that. Okay? So that's why I think at least initially we do need to benchmark the spectral response in a numerically exact manner and then controllably see what we can do and what we cannot do. Okay? Because as you see, it is, um, if we want to conclusively answer the question on what is the nature 
of the oscillations in the sense of being able to, to give a weight to the electronic part, if we call that the non-trivial one, then we have to be sure that um, the way we have to identify the Hamiltonian parameters is as reliable as possible. Yeah. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you so much. Uh, there is a second question that um, um, was asked um, anonymously, so apologies for that, but I will rely it anyway. Okay, so I will convey it anyway. It's a quick one. And the question addresses basically um, a, a perceived mismatch in a way between the theoretical slash numerical progress that um, is being pushed forward currently and the uh, progress that in standard experimental level we are we are witnessing in this specific area. So this is an example where it seems that the theoretical description, the numerical description, has moved much faster than what the experiment of able to do that. Is that so? Uh, I wouldn't say so, right? In the sense that um, people have been doing to this spectra for years, right? Uh, in fact, all these type of experiments come from exporting uh, from the infrared to the visible techniques that are relatively old, right? The point is that the amount of information that is encoded in this multidimensional response is very large, right? And actually, I would say state of the art, nobody has computed the 2D spectra of FMO with the full spectral density. So this may be doable, hopefully, in, um, let's say, in a year or so. It is definitely in, in our agenda, right? But this was something we couldn't have done uh, five years ago. So really, this has moved in parallel with the development of more and more efficient tensor network methods. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Susanna. I think I think we have um, we are now ready to give the word to the stage to uh, Professor Jerry McKenna, who is the senior vice president of the Royal Irish Academy. But before doing that, let me let me thank Susanna for a fantastic talk. Thank Joanne and the team for all the work that they have done in order to to arrange uh, to arrange for this event. Joanna is, is supporting is supporting this event in and no for for a number of years, and it's so only only through the, the support that this can happen. And I would like to thank the Royal Irish Academy for uh, working together with uh, with the school and and with Queens on um, celebrating every year the the um, legacy of John Bell, um, which. Um, should be should be should be acknowledged uh, even more than what we are able to do through this through this event. So thank you very much, and thank you again, Susanna, for for um, for your time. Professor McKenna, please. Thank you, Mauro, and uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, I'm Jerry McKenna, senior vice president of the Royal Irish Academy, and the Academy is is very pleased to be involved again this year with the Chief Executives Club uh, and the School of Mathematics and Physics at Queen's University Belfast as we celebrate John Bell Day uh, together. Uh, the Royal Irish Academy supports John Bell Day as we see Bell as a role model for the young people of Northern Ireland, inspiring them to see education and science as a route by which they can fulfill their greatest ambitions uh, like Bell did. This year's John Bell Lecture is, uh, I'm sure you will agree, uh, most uh, was most enlightening we would like to thank Professor Susanna Helga for her exceptional insights and contributions into quantum effects in biology. Thank you very much. We would also like to thank Professor Mauro Paternostro, head of the School of Mathematics and Physics at Queen's, for his moderating the Q&A session, and Professor Chris Johnson for his introduction. Behind the scenes, Joanne Mallon and her team should be credited for their organization, along with Mauro, uh, for this event. I would also like to thank Karen Muldowney and her team at the Communications Department in the Royal Ash Academy for their support. But lastly, thank all of you for attending and for your questions. Good day. This year's John Bell Lecture is, uh, I'm sure you will agree, uh, most uh, was most enlightening. And we would like to thank Professor Susanna Helga for her exceptional insights and contributions into quantum effects in biology. Thank you very much. We would also like to thank Professor Mauro Paternostro, 
head of the School of Mathematics and Physics at Queen's for his moderating the Q&A session and Professor Chris Johnson for his introduction. Behind the scenes, Joanne Mallon and her team should be credited for their organization along with Morrow uh, for this event. I would also like to thank Karen Muldowney and her team at the Communications Department in the Royal Ash Academy for their support. But lastly, thank all of you for attending and for your questions. Good day.